Hi everyone and welcome to the Chef's Table series. My name is Carol O'Connor, co-host of this instructional cooking show. We have decided to take the show on the road. Today we are in one of Boston's neighborhoods, Jamaica Plain, known for its variety of restaurants. We are filming the show at the Loring Greeno House, a beautiful historical home full of artifacts and very colorful rooms. Today we have executive chef Alexander Dubois of the Haven Restaurant. He and Joe are going to be making a very special Scottish seafood stew. So let's go over to Joe and Alexander. Good evening. I'm Chef Joe Murphy, co-host of the Chef's Table series. This show is produced by the Chef's Table Foundation. And today we have a unique cuisine that you really don't see very often. Actually, I have never seen it. And we have a wonderful chef, Alexander Dubois. And he hails from The Haven, which is a Scottish restaurant. So the meal we're going to have tonight, Chef, is a... It is a Scottish sea stew using a lot of varied uh, seafoods from our area as well as the North Atlantic, being us and Scotland. And it will also consist using a white pudding chicken sausage in this. Right. Can you explain to our viewing audience what white pudding is? Well, white pudding is a chicken sausage that is also... Um, bound with a bread kind of product, soaked in milk or other dairy. And we make it ourselves, okay. but any just high quality, wonderful chicken sausage can be a great substitute for it. Okay, so, just, so yeah. if you're thinking in terms of uh, producing this dish for your home use, a, a, a very good quality chicken sausage yes. would would completely fit it perfectly. Okay, and a chef explained to me the the pudding aspect came from the fact that there is bread yes. in there. Yes. So, uh, having said that, uh, I'd like to talk to you about something uh, very uh, unique. Chef has on a kilt, and he has uh, a belt. He has his chef's knife in a scabbard. Mm -hmm and you have this pouch that hangs off the front. Yes. And historically, as I've been told, I've never worn a kilt, but there's some sort of a debate going on as to wearing a kilt in Scotland right now. Is that correct? Actually, I believe there is a small uh, talk on that, and that's mostly on whether or not it's currently appropriate to right, wear traditionally. Because they don't wear anything under the kilt. And having said that, uh, I will assure you that Chef Alexander is not going to flash this family-oriented TV show. Do, do we have your word, Chef? You have my word. I will not flash the audience. Okay, great. That's great. Now, let's talk about mise en place, which is a French term, and it means basically everything in its place and that cooking experience is going to be far more joyful for you. Now, I notice uh, as, as in your recipe, where it's a stew, uh, you have what we call a mirepoix, which is... The carrots, the celery, the onions. Right, and the way I was trained, it's 50% onion, 25% is celery, and 25% is carrot. But this is a creative process do not be afraid to experiment because you know your tastes, your family's tastes, your guest taste. So take a little bit of a license and if it doesn't come out the way you want it, the next time make it an adjustment. It's that simple. Yeah. Okay. I agree here. I actually am going to be doing the 50, 25, 25 in this one. Oh, great. And I'm actually going to start. We have our water already simmering here. I'm going to start by putting in a little over a cup of Bellhaven Ale, or any brown ale will completely make this 
dish. Right. And Bell Ale is a Scottish ale? It is ale. a Scottish traditional ale. Okay, great. But you can use any yeah. dark any beer? Any dark ale. Ale, yeah. okay. No, none of the Guinness Stouts are in that right. variety, but anything just like brown, has to be an ale, will just work beautifully with this. Great, and that's keeping with the authentic yes. style or, or cuisine. Okay, so we put in two quarts of water. We brought that to a simmer, and we don't want a rolling boil because once we put the fish heads in, do you have fish bodies yep, as well? Yep, these are, these are cod um, frames. Right. Uh, if you're gonna go to your local monger or any grocery right. thing, yeah. they'd just be referred as frames, which just is bones, head, tails. Right, so it. Chef just gave you a tip. When you go to your fishmonger or to your supermarket, and I recommend going to a, a supermarket that has very fresh fish, tell them you're looking for frames. You want to make a stock. And the reason we don't want this water boiling, because if that happens, then all the little bits mm -hmm. of whatever is on those frames and if you're doing chicken stock or a beef stock, you just want that really at a very light simmer. Otherwise, it'll, your stock will become very cloudy. You'll have a lot of particles floating. So yeah. that's the objective here. So I'm going to be adding these guys in. Are they small enough to take one out? We can yeah, I should be able audience. to pull a guy out. Okay. I'm going to move him over here. He's actually broken up. That's great. Just to I give him, him an idea. I have him a little broken up. About. They're just heads bodies. Right. And these will make an excellent stock. So don't become timid and say, oh, I don't want to touch that because the finished dish, this will make a huge difference. Okay. Thank you, chef, for showing our audience what we're going to be working with. Now, again, this water, you know, the steam coming off it, but it's not rolling boiling. So what's next? So we are going to insert them right into our Right. into our Bellhaven water mixture here. Right. Slide them in just all nice and gently. Yeah. Don't want to splash anyone here. Right. And this is about a pound okay. of head and tail and body. Right. Excellent. They're just going to get right in there. Yeah. Now, yeah. as we were talking about the mirepoix, right, right after we add these, we want to go right into the mirepoix. Right. So we have our 50% onions, which is right. about a cup and a half, actually. Yeah. Those guys can go right in. Okay. Then, of course, our carrots. These are just chopped up, peeled. Right. You don't have to get too fancy on your mirepoix. I know Chef just put out a medium dice onion in there. Would it be okay if you just it would be as long as it? as long as you don't have the uh, outside of the onion, the outside of the carrot, because as you were talking about cloudiness earlier. Right that's just gonna add that cloudiness to your broth and it's not, it's not gonna be as good of a broth right. if you leave it. So peel your carrots, peel and, your onions. Okay, so you have your 50% onion, 25% carrot, and 25% celery. And that's going to really help flavor your broth. And again, this is just a light simmer. And Chef, how long do you, would you let this go? I would generally? normally let this go between a half an hour up to an hour. It will be ready pretty much within like okay. 10, right. 10, 15 right. flavor wise. But if you really want just that concentrated, yeah. amazing broth, you're going to want that half an hour minimum. Okay. Uh, one thing I want to talk about is on stocks, generally you put a bouquet garni, okay? And that is a bay leaf, four to six black peppercorns, uh, a couple of sprigs uh, or stems from parsley, and a couple of sprigs of thyme. Right. Now, are we doing a... We are doing close to that. Okay. But a little heavier in the peppercorn, okay. a lot heavier in with thyme. Yeah. And lemon. Okay. So we have two lemons chopped up here. It's okay. You're going to... Rough chop. Rough right. chop. Yep. Those are just going to get right in there. Okay. And then we have here a mixture of black peppercorns and lavender. Oh, This nice. would traditionally be with heather, which is a, another flower from Scotland, very traditional. But lavender is going to be found 
just everywhere. Any grocery store you go to, you'll be able to find lavender. In, in, in the bottled in, stage? Or? In uh, just dried herbs, just yeah. in the dried section. Okay. And right. that's why we're using it. Right. So we're just going to get that in there. Yeah. And that has that really right. nice floral smell. Right. It's very fragrant, so it's going you know, to be wonderful. I'm just going to move stuff around a sure. little bit in there. Just to make sure the water's touching everything. Yeah. Uh, to that, we are going to end with our thyme. I'm going to grab the thyme. Right. I'm going to put it on here. Oh, that's a good handful of thyme. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's about two and a half ounces. Wow. And, you know, you normally buy it by like the four ounce. Right. The quarter pound, so. Right. It's going to be a very hearty dish. Yeah. So this these is aromatics. Gonna get, oh, yeah. Get that guy in there. Right. And we're going to put the lid back on. We're going to let that hang out for a while and right. just become this dish. Right. It turned up just a little. Right. One thing I want to talk about, bouquet garni, generally you use a cheesecloth. Mm -hmm. Well, we had a chef on, he's been on the show in the last two and a half years, three times. And he put together a bouquet garni. I figured he was going to use the traditional cheesecloth. Well, he did something that I thought was a great idea. He took two regular coffee filters. Mm -hmm and put the thyme, the bay leaf, the peppercorns, the stems from parsley, and then he rolled it up. And what you do is you tie a string around it and then you can tie it to the handle. That way there at the end, you don't have to strain. And it, it was a great idea and I've used his technique and it works fabulous. This one, we're doing the free form because we're just going to be basically sure. pulling some off the top, right. pouring into our saute pan, which right. will be the next step here, which I will be turning on my saute pan here. Right. So, and again, Chef just gave you a tip, all right? If you don't want to bother putting together and tying up a uh, bouquet garni, this stock here, he's going to spoon or ladle off, right off the top, so you don't have to be concerned about floating particles, uh, particles items, right. right? Peppercorns, because no one wants to bite into one of those directly. Right, exactly. Okay, so the next uh, the next segment is going to be sautéing. Yes, we're going to get our pan like to a medium high heat, like just enough that we can get our oil in there and just start glistening. Okay. Now, do you have a suggestion? You know. This, I'm sure the Scottish, I'm guessing, they don't use olive oil, per se. No, they would, they would just use, and okay. they would normally use like a straight butter or in that thing. Yeah. But for sauteing any amount of heat, as right. we, as we, right. most of us have experienced in our own home, butter's not the most. Right. It has a very low heat resistance. It melts, it turns brown and burns very quickly. So I'm guessing you're using a canola oil. Or I am. I'm doing it blended, okay. so it's it's about 90% uh, canola, 10% olive oil. Oh, nice. So you're going to so get a little bit of that. You're going to get a little bit. Yeah. Oh, good. Very good. But yeah, we if pure olive oil. We'd almost be a little too Mediterranean. Exactly. <laughs> Not very Scottish. Yeah, it does have a very low heat tolerance as opposed to the blended oil. So keep that in mind. And again, try out a few things. See what you like to do. So I'm going to put like about two to three tablespoons. I'm using my kitchen spoon here, and it's, it's roughly around three. We have a little crackle. Right. We have a little bit of uh, residual water. But yeah. That's not bad. Get a little spin. Yeah. Now, did you hear what the chef just said? And this is sort of a safety tip. So some great little tips come up as we're doing this. There was a little water in the pan, the pan was hot, the oil hit it, so you're going to get a splatter. So just be aware of these things, it's just you could get a small burn from the oil spattering on you and you know, these are little tips. Or if you have the gas burner at home, you could actually ignite the oil. Right. And not only is that not, is a safety issue, but then it will make your dish taste of kerosene, which is like the worst right, thing you right. can possibly yeah. do. Yeah, that's not the joy of cooking. So, so my guess is you're going to cook the chicken first? We are. Okay. As this is an already cooked through product. Right. Okay. You know? So yeah, these get poached off and made, and if you buy one at the store, you're going to want to like roast it or 
right. just boil it off first. Okay. Because we want to start with an already cooked. Right. Because we have our medium high burner. Right. And we're just going to take these guys and we're going to lay them up with that. These flesh are about, down? Yes, flesh down. These are about an inch to two inches long. Okay. So my question is this. They have been poached, so it is a cooked product. Yes. But we're sauteing them, and I'm guessing you want caramelization? Yes, I want that nice brown right. each side of the right. sausage. And, and that will add to the flavor once the stock gets in there and renders mm -hmm. that off. Okay, so there's your tip. Even though these sausages have been poached, we want to get some caramelization on the flesh side or the meat side, which is what Chef is doing now. And once that gets brown, he'll turn it over, he gets a little bit of color, and then he'll do the same on the other side. This will also not only give you eye appeal, but it's going to help with your flavor of the finished product. Yeah, so these guys are going to hang out for like a couple, uh, you know, seconds to minutes. Right. Okay. Probably about one to two. Yeah. We can see that these guys over here are already starting to get that, Ooh. this color right here, yeah. which is just Great. this nice Gold. sear look. Yeah, excellent. And I'm just going to give those a flip to their other side now that they're, they're acting like this. Now, if you buy a chicken sausage and you do not want to spend a lot of time cooking, say you come home from work, you're doing a special dish for your family, your friends, they're already poached, okay? So just keep that in mind. If you buy a, a nice quality chicken sausage, poach them the night before where you'll have a little bit more time and then refri fr uh, refrigerate them. Now you might get some uh, stickage here when you have the meat side down. Yeah. That can be avoided with a hotter pan or yeah. Yeah. It's not that actually big of a deal. This is just going to go right back into the broth. You're going to have those little pieces, and it's not going to be right. an issue. It's just yeah. going to be more flavor into Would you, it. Uh, you just gave us another tip. Would you explain to our viewing audience about the heat of the pan and sticking? Yeah. Um, as long as your oil is hot enough, when you actually put your meat, fish, or any item in, it's going to sear almost immediately, creating like a little barrier of... Um, crispness and, and moisture removal. Right. So it has to be above of right around 400 for that to actually happen. Right. So you're going medium high in that area, but when you put that product in, you want this sizzling that hopefully you're hearing now. And that absolutely retards the sticking, all right? Particularly in a fish, because fish is delicate, unless it's calamari or something like that but it's flaky, so that will reduce from tearing the fish apart. So, after you sear these, um, what I like to do is actually pull them off and reserve them and cook this and add them back later. Right. So we're just gonna remove them, put them in our little tray here. As you can see, we have a lot of nice little color on there and yep. we have a lot of little bits in our pan. As I said, that's not a problem with this dish. Right. It's just going to go right back in the broth. Great. So the next item that we'd be wanting to put in is our hard shell fish, because okay. we need to get these guys to that point that they're going to open up. Okay. We're actually going to put those in before we go to our chopped onion. And you know, traditionally you'd want to sweat out your onion, add your shellfish, everything. Right. But we really want these guys to let their juice, juice out, out and all that. Right. So again, you're putting in cockle. Yes. And. Mussels. Mussels. Cockles, you said you can find around you here? You can find around here, once again, right. question for the monger. Right. If they can't get them or the order minimum is too large for you at home, right. small clams will just completely Work just do just as well, and that's the point I wanted to make. Okay. So we are going to go with them first. I am making a uh, larger batch here. Right. You know, between everything. Okay. So we have those guys in here, and they're just letting out their water and scraping out the pan. Right. And then you can go right in with your mussels. Excellent. These are just standard mussels. They've right. been washed twice to make sure that we don't have any grittiness, and uh, they've been de-bearded. 
So they have right. checked for any little of the hairs on the sure. side. Yeah. Make sure that you right. get all that off. Because right. that's just added grit that you don't want to eat. Exactly. And if you've never worked with mussels, I'm sure many of you have tried mussels in a restaurant. And they do come with a little bit of a beard. It sort of looks like a hairy beard. And you just take a knife and scrape yeah. it off and get rid of it. It doesn't add anything to the dish. And all of this is a little irritant if you end up chewing on it. Right. So you have these guys, they're releasing their, you know, their own moisture into the pan as they go. Right. And we're going to top that with a cup of uh, chopped onions. This is just a rough medium chop. Right. It doesn't have to be super fancy. Right. We're going to get that on top. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to just break it up, get it down there. Move it around a little. Okay. So that's just going to hang out for a little. Right. And then after that, we do our calamari yes, fish. Yes, our squid. Squid. A wonderful squid. Right, squid. This is tubes is and tentacles. Yeah. So. Excellent. Now, in buying calamari in a store, I find some of them just aren't that good. If you can get a domestic out of Rhode Island, because generally you're going to find frozen on occasion, in the supermarket, you will find them as a fresh product, but it's seasonal. So you're generally gonna be working with a frozen product. It tends to be a little bit stronger. I know that they've been dipped in phosphates as preservatives and that type of thing. So what other area? Mexico, they have a, a, a very good product. And uh, I'm trying to think, there's another place in the world, maybe off of Spain, but I don't think you're going to see those. Yeah, the Mediterranean and the Atlantic there near Spain and Portugal and all that yeah. is just not going to be in our market normally. Right. And when it is, the price is through the roof. Yeah. Right. So yeah. as local as you can find it. Right. Okay, good. <laughs> as, as you were stating. Right. One thing I do want to mention, when you're buying your fresh fish, do not be embarrassed to ask if this is a wet fish or a dry fish, or scallops in particular. And we've talked about this on other shows. If they're wet, that means they've been dipped in mm -hmm. preservatives. It adds fluid to the scallop, for instance. It blows it up a little bit, so you're not really getting a, uh, oh, in my opinion, a really wholesome uh, product. And in a professional restaurant, I don't know of any restaurant that would use a wet product. No, also the uh, dries just sear that much better and have their natural flavors about right. it. Right. So we were starting to see here, a lot of our muscles are already opened up. Some of our cockles are. And they just, they'll just like open up fast. That's, that's the great reason to use uh, cockles also. Besides being traditional, they're just so small that their saute time is just quick. quick. So these guys are gonna keep opening as we cook, but we are gonna add our uh, squid in as we've been talking. And I'm just gonna go ahead and layer this all over the top here. All right. So these guys are gonna slowly uh, saute and poach up and they're gonna tighten up as they go. Uh -huh. And that's when you pretty much know they're done, that they just seal up and they're a hard piece. Right. Once again, we have another couple seconds there, but I am going to add a nice large pinch of salt here the moment we added our calamari. Right. I was wondering when we were going to see salt. <laughs> we're actually going to put some seasoning in there. Right. Is it now, I, I talk about this on every show. Are you using kosher salt, sea salt? I am using kosher salt. You can use sea salt. Sea salt will make this even more of that oceany, flavor. beautiful flavor. Yeah. I'm using kosher because it is just the easiest to grab, right? literally, like the grabbing. Right, exactly. You can really measure it, and it's not an overly salty salt. Right. Like, say, an iodized, which just tastes salty. Right, and, 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 if, and I've talked about this pretty much on every show. He uses kosher salt because you can pick it up much easier. The crystals are much larger. 
I do not use table salt at home in any of my cooking. I absolutely prefer the kosher salt. And it's a lower sodium content, and you do not lose any flavor no, that I find. It, it, you, you'll normally have a better flavor because you're actually adding it in the right places as iodized. Another thing about the ultra fine is that it will clump. Right. And I have noticed that in a lot of dishes that if you use iodized salt, it will clump up sometimes in certain areas of your dish or your meat might right. taste saltier. Yeah. And other sides might not be as seasoned as well. Right. Okay. You know, and again, this is a, a seafood dish. So if you want to use sea salt, it has the same characteristic as the kosher salt. The, the crystals are about the same size and you won't use as much, but you're going to get a little bit more of the ocean flavor. And I know a chef that that's what he uses. He'll use sea salt when he's cooking a seafood dish. Okay, so we're cooking so, up here. Right, and we've opened up almost more, um, almost 75% of our uh, shellfish here. Okay. And a lot of our calamari is almost to the cook point. Excellent. There's a lot of liquid that's in the pan now. It's not really a dry pan of oil anymore of the crisping. And that's all the liquid that has come out of the onions, of the mussels, of the cockles, and the calamari. The calamari. Right. Great. So we're going to put in our fish now, which we have Scottish salmon, and we also have some local haddock from Massachusetts. Excellent. Now, you said Scottish salmon. Yes, I'm using Scottish salmon. It's a little higher in fat content due to it being one of the cold water salmons. Right. Like very cold water, as opposed to, say, the Chile and Chilean has the season of cold. You'll find a lot of that. Yeah. You'll find a lot of the Nova Scotian. Okay. And the Alaskan stuff, of course, is even colder and has even More better fat. fat content. Right. Yeah, and you know, you'll see a lot of salmon on sale, and I find it very good, but it's farm raised salmon. So this is blue water salmon, so you're going to have a fuller flavor with it. And, but I don't find salmon an overly strong fish. Either it, way. It isn't a fishy fish. It's, it's right. kind of its own fish. Right. It and tuna are their own category when it comes to fish. Right. So, you know, if, again, if you're, you know, cost conscious, which we all are, um, domestic salmon is fine. I'm saying that, Chef, I'm not trying to take away from what you're serving. And remember, restaurants are serving. The restaurants we have... They are buying the freshest, the highest quality products, ingredients to give you a really great dining experience. But, you know, I don't feel to be a problem substituting a farm-raised salmon. No. I see that on sale quite a bit. And so, so a lot of the farms out there are starting to use new techniques that are really becoming more environmentally conscious. Oh, great. And, you know, yeah. there's a lot of them. You can go online. You can look it up. But yeah. So. Okay, so. I'm going to add the salmon first here because we want to make sure that we have as little breakage with our fish as possible. Right. And salmon is the hardier guy. And these guys are just like little chunks here. They've, right. I've taken the skin off. The skin tends to be just a little chewy when done this way. Right. And these guys are just going to go right on top again. Excellent. Now, a quick question, Chef. As you're sauteing, in order to cook that salmon, because they're laying the salmon and the calamari, mm -hmm. and I'm guessing your haddock as well, is not going to be on the direct heat. It's going to be on top. So do you right. cover that with anything, Jeremy? No, I allow the steam to come through. And also, by the time we add that, the last fish, we will be pouring our broth over top, which has been already at like a simmer. It's already very hot. Right. And that's basically what's cooking it. Yeah. We can already see here on this piece of salmon that's just been on top, not yeah. touching anything, that he's already almost steamed, almost oh, poached yeah. through. Right. And we're going to add our white fish right as that guy's at the halfway point on top again. And we are once again going to put more of that kosher salt on top. Right. So we're basically seasoning this in several steps, and we're seasoning almost every each ingredient as it hits the pan. Right. And then after we get our broth, we'll do a last yeah. seasoning to right. taste. 
And that's a great learning uh, comment for, for you, the, the home chef. You know, getting a great meal is about building flavors as you go along. So chef added his, his kosher salt when he put his calamari in. Then he added some when he put his salmon in. Yep. And he just added some with his haddock. You're not going to drown it in salt, but season it as you go along. And again, this creative process, it's about layering flavors. So we're, we're almost there on this. And I am going to move it around, but we're going to start not moving it around as much now right. because getting back to the idea of not breaking it up. Right. Yeah, and Chef just gave you another tip. You know, on fresh fish, you don't want to move it around too much because you don't want to break it up. So I'm actually going to take our pan and go up to high now. We've okay. been at medium high the entire yeah. time. We're going at high now because we really want to get the juices in there boiling and we're going to be adding our broth that we've been simmering. Simmering, great. So I'm actually going to go ahead and take some of our broth. Wow. And I'm just going to take a tiny bit of this broth first. And this has all that like fishy goodness and all that stuff. So yeah. we're, I'm just right. skimming off the top a couple as I said, this is a kitchen spoon. This one's right around four tablespoons. So I'm gonna be putting just around a cup in there right now. You know, in order to, we made a two quart uh, hydration for this stock. Once you're finished with your dish, take this off your stove, let it come to room temperature, Put it in a nice plastic container, mark it fish stock, and then keep it if you want to make a fish chowder, a clam chowder, or anything that's fish, a fish chowder, you know, you have a stock all prepared, and obviously it'll keep a long time in your freezer. Now we're going to take our sausage and put it back in the pan. And as I said, we, we rested the, we seared and rested this. Because if you left this in the entire time, you both would not have had the uh, space to move around your seafood. But you also would possibly chance breaking it completely up. Right. And just having like a ground meat product in your right. stew instead of these like pieces of, yeah. that you'll be able to pull out. Right. Now, we are not going to show any bread, but I'm guessing where it's Scotland, like in Ireland, they have these hearty brown breads, yes. these full grain breads. If you serve this in your restaurant, what type of a bread are you serving this? I with? would actually be doing a um, kind of a sourdough based bread, like a, like a loaf yeah. that we like to slice. We like to grill it up, Great. keep yeah. it fairly thick so you'd be able to just soak this up. So, right. And do you rub that bread when you before you're grilling it with garlic or oil or you just sort of grill on no, each no, side? Normally um, we actually grill on each side, pull off and then have a butter that I would like to uh, zest a lemon or two into. Oh nice. And just have like a citrus butter that you'd rub on after the grilling. Okay. Because we put our lemons in our stock here. Right. That's going to bring that citrus element as we all love our lemon with our seafood. Oh absolutely. So you can, you can see that we are really getting to the point that some of our white fish is all the way cooked. Nice. Some of our salmon is not quite there. Yeah. And this is just, it's just very important to like lightly move it around. Just keep watching it. Right. And well, you know, on fish, uh, our wonderful co-host, Carol O'Connor, is a salmon fanatic. She's a vegetarian, but she will eat fish. And if if I cook salmon, we just, I'll say, do you want to have, I'll make some salmon, would you like to come over? And we always have a debate on how well that salmon should be done. But, uh, and she wins, of course. And uh, I like my fish just so it flakes mm -hmm. and it's not dry. But, you know, in this process where it's really being steamed. Yeah, we're going to be flaking all the way through and we're not going to. We're, we're basically going to be cooked through here. Yeah. Which, you know, salmon is good everything from raw to right. flaking and falling apart. Yeah. 
So at this moment, I'm actually going to be putting a little more broth in here. Okay. And I'm just going to be doing this rough with a uh, spoon because this one doesn't really have too much problem with the bokeh garni. Now, this one does look cloudy, and as it actually should. We were talking a lot about the clouding. Yep. But this is not that same kind of clouding. This is due to just like that's wow. all fish flavor right. and all that beautiful stuff. Yeah. So we're pretty much coated in here now. Excellent. So we're going to put that back there. Yeah. We're going to leave this guy for a little longer until some more of our fish come through. Wow. We're going to grab one of these beautiful balls. And we'll right. Now, is we'll this a, uh, on the menu or is it a seasonal? This is something that will be featured at time to time. Yeah. Uh, we had a version of it with uh, black pudding. That oh. is the both right. UK, Ireland, and that area traditional yeah. sausage using pork and beef and such. Right. And that one just came off okay. pretty recently. Right. But normally this stuff is very late summer, early, early fall, fall right. in that area. But it is beautiful for the summer. Right. It's really good any time of the year, Right. I feel. Yeah, you know, in Italy, we had the corporate chef from Strega. Mm -hmm. And he did a dish called zuppa di pecci. No pasta. Grilled bread with all kinds of shellfish. He had lobster there. He had shrimp. But he said, in Sicily, where he's from, that's the meal, OK? It's all shellfish, some fresh fish, as uh, Chef Alexander did. But, you know, just bread and, uh, and the fish. And it's, it's a full meal. It's yeah. absolutely delicious. It's all protein, wonderful broth. Right. And I'm sure bread. people have noticed how I like to keep myself nice and trim. So I'm on board with no pasta. I'm going to... In plating, I'll do probably a little fancier plating than, you know, you can just pour this in if you'd like. Yeah. And there's going to be no problems. But for the amount that I have here, I'm going to just layer my sausage into the bowl first. You know, we, we tend to get a little fancy at the restaurant, but that's because. Right. For service, you right. want the eye appeal. You want to give a special experience. Well, you know, you're going to have guests over your house. You yeah. might want to do that anyways. Right. So I'm just pulling out shellfish here and yeah. pulling out everything. My burner seems not to like that. Yeah. Well, these are designed to turn off as soon as that pan comes off. And it's a contact heat where it's, I'm not that technical about them, but I understand it's almost a magnet. These are special pans. Oh, this is looking fantastic. So we're, just, we're just layering all this like seafoody wonderfulness in yeah. here. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna finish up this guy first and you can just take sure. your whole thing and pour that till about there. Right. So that's um, the completed dish here. And you have some of everything. You know, it's always easy when you watch a cooking show to talk about the aroma. If you were here, you would be as anxious as I am to dive into this dish. And, you know, with the really earthy ingredients and the lemon and the thyme and uh, the black pepper and the dried flowers, the... Uh, the wonderful lavender. The lavender. Uh, the onion, the carrot, and, and these aromas are just screaming. Joe, forget the viewing audience, dive in and eat. Chef, this has been a really great show for me, and you did a, a, an exceptional job explaining. Uh, again, this show is designed to be instructional, so I'm sure you've picked up some great tips. And remember, if you want to rewatch this show, you can go on to the Chef's Table Series.tv website, watch this show, get the recipe for this wonderful dish, and it will all be available for your reviewing. And thank you for watching.
Hi everyone, I'm here with Rob Costa of the Massachusetts Beverage Alliance and we are here to pair Chef Alexander's from the Haven, his Scottish stew bouillabaisse, which has not only fish in it, but also a bunch of other meats, right? Some sausages and things like that. Perfect. Seems, yeah. Now, what type of beer did you choose today? Well, with the Scottish dish, I chose a Scottish beer. Oh, perfect. Yeah. This is Innocent Gun Brewing. Uh, the brewery themselves focus on a lot of uh, oak aged and different, um, different barrel aging beers. Mm -hmm. They've had a rum, they've had an Irish whiskey, they've had a few different interesting ones, um, you know, even to the point where you've had a sherry aged cask. Uh, oh, this wow. particular beer, however, is a simple oak aged IPA. What does IPA mean? Uh, it means India Pale Ale. So the style originated uh, back in the colonial period of uh, England. They were trying to hop their beers to a point where you were going to have oh, enough sort of them fresh enough to get over to the soldiers. Hops mm -hmm. uh, actually are used as a preservative. Oh, I yeah. see. Interesting. So is this going to be a light beer? or Fairly. It'll be fairly light. Okay. Uh, you'll see it has, a, it has a pretty distinct malt body as well. Mm -hmm. Them being Scottish don't love to buy hops from the English. <laughs> Historically never had a really great relationship. <laughs> but um, uh, it's not going to be too intense as an IPA, but you'll see. All I'll right. open it right now. Let's try it. So, you'll see if you've ever seen another IPA, probably won't look very similar to it. Um, I think it comes out a little darker than most, only slightly. Mm -hmm. And if you want to give that a whiff, Thank you. you might get something out of that that we normally wouldn't get from a lot of IPAs. Smell a little vanilla? Yes, I do. Oh. So, now do you do any, like, you know, I'm not really a beer drinker, so do you do any like We're twirlies? Not <laughs> <laughs> do you do any twirlies or you just um, drink it down? Typically, it's a little interesting. I mean, I've known people that go so far as, you know, you do, you know, twirl around the glass a little bit, mm -hmm. you know, give it a whiff, you do mm -hmm. that quick sniff thing. I've known even, there are some professionals out there that have gotten beer up in their nasal cavity. Oh. And that's what they do. <laughs> that's how they get a better um, olfactory experience. Oh, cool. I don't know. I don't do that. Mm -hmm. I just do it like this. All right, let's try it. Right. Mm. Ooh. I can see why it goes with that stew. Right, absolutely. You know, I know that a lot of Scottish dishes, they do use, you know, sausages, and of course they use seafood. Mm -hmm. Why this is great is, notice how it has those like oaky vanilla notes mm -hmm. that I think complement something that has a lot of salt. Um, especially something like that, you're gonna have, you know, a little bit of that salt content. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that, that nice vanilla crisp note works very well. Yep. Uh, the it's vanilla. not as heavy as I thought it would be. No, not at all, no. I, I always think yeah. that maybe Scottish beers would be yeah. very um, heavy. Well, you'd be, uh, you'd be right there. They're known for one beer that uh, is actually referred to as a wee heavy. It's sort wee of heavy. a signature <laughs> beer for them, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, this definitely being a little different took sort of that English IPA. Mm -hmm. So if you tried it and you didn't get too much of that hot bitterness, it's not very citrusy, it's not very piney, it's more, more I'd say, earthy. Mm. Uh, more maybe herby, a little more floral than really too bitter and in your face, which I thought would work yeah. well with something that's a little bit, you know, more muted. Of course, it's Scottish food, so it's not going to be too, too intense. It, yeah, right. it doesn't yeah. have that many, um, you know, spices yeah, to it. Very, and whistles. Very, <laughs> so this would actually yeah. complement it, yeah. bring it to a different notch with all the right. different notes inside. Yeah, I think it would bring out, uh, especially if they are using sausages, you know, just the way you create sausage, mm -hmm. it does leave sort of an intense flavor and you don't want to overpower that with something too intense for a beer. Yeah. Um, so I think this particular beer does very well with the oak aging. Perfect. All right. Well, Rob, thanks for, um, for today's beer pairing of the week. I appreciate it. Not at all. Awesome. Twist my arm to talk about beer. <laughs> so right. everyone, this has been um, this week's beer pairing for the week and we'll see you next week. Hi, I'm Marjorie Gann and I work at Ethos in Jamaica Plain and we're an organization that serves elders and people of all ages with disabilities. We're also the nutrition provider for Southwest Boston, so we serve Meals on Wheels, community cafes and provide in-home nutrition consultation. I've been a registered dietitian, wife and mom for over 30 years, so I've developed some pretty good nutrition tips to help that are practical and easy to do. Today I'd like to talk a little bit about sodium. Sodium is half of salt, which is actually sodium chloride, and it's estimated that in the United States, people eat about, say, give or take 2,500 milligrams of sodium a day. Now, the Institute of Medicine says it should only be 1,500. And for people who eat a lot of salt, which probably would be 
males around 30, you're actually talking as much as, say, 4,000 milligrams. So here's a little quiz. Here are three foods, and they have different amounts of sodium. Which food on this table is the saltiest? Is it the hamburger bun, my little chocolate cupcake, or the ounce of potato chips? And I will bet that 80% of you will say it's the potato chips. But being sneaky, these are actually the lowest sodium food on this table. This is an ounce of potato chips. These happen to be a reduced fat potato chip, which have less salt on them. So these come in at 85 milligrams for this size serving. The cupcake, and this is a pretty little cupcake if you look at it, 135 milligrams, and you'd probably eat both of the ones that came in the package. And the hamburger bun is the surprise because that's got 220 milligrams of sodium. So if you add into this the hamburger, the french fries, and probably maybe four tablespoons of ketchup, we're really looking at 1,000 milligrams in this one meal versus the Institute of Medicine's recommendation of 1,500 milligrams for the entire day. So you can see why those 30-year-old men are getting their excess sodium. So the easiest ways to cut down on sodium? Probably eat fewer processed foods, lots more fresh fruits and vegetables. And that's my tip for the day. I'm Marjorie Gann, and I'm here for Chef's Table. Thank you for joining me. Hi, everyone. I'm Carol O'Connor of the Chef's Table series. Today with me is Executive Director Andrew Zaro of JP Center South Main Streets. So Andrew, thank you for being on the show with me. Thank you for Andrew, did I say me. that correctly? You did. Thank you. You did. So tell our viewers, what is Main Streets in Boston? Yeah, so um, Boston Main Streets is mm -hmm. actually a lot bigger than just Center South Main Streets. We are one of 20 districts. Uh, yeah, wow. It's pretty big. A lot of people don't realize just how much coverage we have within the city. Mm -hmm. So we're one of 20 districts. Um, to give you a quick history, it started um, I think in 1992. Yeah. Mayor Menino started a pilot project with Roslindale, which mm -hmm. is now Roslindale Village Main Streets. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, a national model that yeah. started in a rural environment, um, and the point was to revitalize the downtown. Right. So a lot of it's focused on local independent shops, mm -hmm. um, but really making sure that communities uh, maintain a healthy uh, local economy oh. and make sure that they're supporting the local businesses. Right, I was say that's about supporting, right. Exactly. That's so huge. over time, mm -hmm. districts evolved, new ones would pop up, and Center South Main Streets is one of three in Jamaica Plain. There's also Eggleston wow. Square Main Streets and yep. High Jackson Main Streets. Um, but I often joke when people ask, well, because you're so um, geographically oriented, yeah. um, where are you? And I say, well, we're downtown JP. Um, but you know, <laughs> there's, there's plenty of small businesses mm -hmm. in JP. Well, there's, yeah. there's four pillars, we call them, that mm -hmm. you have to adhere to. Um, and those are promotional, um, so a lot of events. We host First Thursday, it's an art walk, mm -hmm. the first Thursday of every month. Um, design, we do a lot of programming uh, through the city of Boston. Yep. Storefront improvement projects, like signage, a right. lot of that. Um, uh, organizations. We work with other nonprofits or organizations in the community, mm -hmm. the Business and Professional Association, right. JP Local First, um, and the last is economic restructuring. So that's really wow. the big picture. Well, where is JP going to be in 10 years? What type of businesses? What mix? Yep. Um, and that's when we have the conversations about local businesses or do we want chains, things like that. Um, and bringing people into Jamaica uh, oh, Plain. Right. And I'm sure there's a lot of people who are very vocal on how they feel JP should be now and going forward. Yes, Jamaica Plain mm -hmm. is a wonderful place and incredibly vocal. Yeah, <laughs> and lots of restaurants too. Yes, we have lots of good food So here. thinking about food, we are here at the Lauren Greeno House and um, you've partnered with them um, during the beautiful weather here during yeah. the summer months to do a, a special market. So the Lauren Greeno House is, as you said, a very beautiful historic property. Yes. Um, it's owned by the Jamaica Plain Tuesday Club. Right. And so we partnered with them uh, to help them out with their farmer's market, which mm -hmm. is every Thursday. Uh, it happens to overlap with our first Thursday art walk. So we oh. are a co-sponsor of their market. Yep. Um, we actually last Thursday launched our Screen on the Green program, which is going to be on the first and third Thursdays of the month. Yep. 
And what's that? Uh, it's uh, we're showing eight movies, and there we got a wonderful projector and a screen. Mm -hmm. It's free to the public. Uh, oh. We started on Thursday. We showed Frozen, which was very exciting. Oh, and it was beautiful that Thursday. It was a really beautiful day. It was a huge turnout, and the community could oh. not have loved it anymore. It was. We're we're really excited to yeah. do the seven more movies, um, mm -hmm. but it's it's sort of. Uh, programming that we as a Main Street organization um, can partner with such a beautiful property um, yes, and, beautiful. And, and help them meet their mission and mm -hmm. we meet our mission and, and the community at large benefits so greatly from it. So it was really wonderful and yeah. I'm excited to see you know, as the weeks come the other programming. Right. Out. So now um, what is the plan for your Main Streets going forward for like the fall? Any initiatives or events? Oh man, yeah. There's there's <laughs> always something going on with the Main Street Can district. Can you share us some stuff? Of course. Well, um, we we shorten the the first Thursday art walk. It used to be year long, um, but it just goes April through October. So we have you know really outstanding mm -hmm. programming for first Thursday. It's the biggest. Last month was the biggest it had been in Center South's history, um, and a lot of that were That's some. Great. It was just some strategic changes we made. Yep. Um, we have. Um, Details aren't worked out, but we have we usually do a business breakfast once every six months. We have a new fundraiser that we'll be launching um, in the fall. But mm -hmm. really, it's just we we do very consistent. The summer months are programming months right. for us, so we do a lot. We try and Planning capitalize and like on the you know we have a lot of natural capital here, right. so we like to do a lot of outdoor stuff. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you'll see us every week at the farmers market here at mm -hmm. the Lauren Greeno. Like I said, the screen on the green movies and and first Thursday and. Believe me, there's, a, there's enough to go around. Excellent. Well, Andrew, thanks again for being on the show. Thank you. And everyone, this has been Carol with my um, um, interesting interview with Andrew Zaro, and we'll see you next time. But to that, we are going to end with our time. I grab the time. Put that oh, that's a good handful of tasks. Yeah. It's, it's, it's about two and a half ounces. Wow. And, you know, you normally buy it by like a four ounce. Right quarter pound so right it's going to be a very hearty dish uh, we had a version of it with uh, black pudding that is the both UK Ireland and that area traditional sausage using pork and beef and such and that one just came off pretty recently but normally this stuff is very late summer early early fall The Chef's Table series is shooting on location in cities and towns across Massachusetts. If you would like to suggest your favorite restaurant or attend a live taping of the show, please visit thechefstableseries.tv.